Greetings respective viewers, I'm George from Ireland and here I am in London um, on Gordon Square and behind me you can see the house where John Maynard Keynes spent about the latter half of his life. Uh, so Keynes is uh, best known as an economist and indeed he's the, the founder of an ism, Keynesianism, which influences many economists down to this day. Obviously his theories were at the height of his popularity really just after his death in 1946. To some, to some extent into, into the 1980s, then they rather fell out of fashion, what was en vogue was, was monetarism. I, I don't know anything about economics as presumably is evident just from those words. Um, and uh, he's come back in to popularity a little bit, where like the Labour Manifesto in the United Kingdom, a bit Keynesian, although that, that uh, didn't do well for them. But that's not really why they sunk in the polls, they Corbyn and Brexit but I shan't um, be, be distracted by that. So uh, Keynes was born in Cambridge. His father was, was, a, was a Cambridge Don. That's to say anyone who's a lecturer at Oxford or Cambridge um, is uh, colloquially known as a Don. If you teach in any capacity, whether you have the title professor, there are loads of other professor, there are loads of other titles for those who teach there. It could be Prilector, Junior Research Fellow, and so on. But just um, the, the, the generic term is Don. Um, which is not um, rude, it's just, it's just casual. And likewise at Trinity College Dublin, as in from, from well, Dominus, like master in, in Latin. Um, so he's one of three children, which is very small for, for the Victorian era, and he won a scholarship to uh, Eton, which was uh, surely the British Empire's most illustrious school at the time. Obviously there weren't just people from the UK who were going there, there were like Maharajas who were going there by that time, but very, very few. Um, so he went, it was in college, because at Eton, there are lots of houses, what, were about, probably about 20 in those days. One of, them, one of those houses is called College, where the King Scholars go, because it was founded by King Henry VI in 1440, and anybody who's a scholar appends KS to his name, so it would have been Keynes KS. And incidentally, his surname is pronounced Keynes, a lot of people think it's Keynes. Now, I know this because when I was a schoolboy, I went to a lecture by his, by his nephew, um, and he said, it is Keynes. And um, they've been dis they've been distinguished in the English Midlands for centuries. They came over with uh, William the Conqueror, and it's a, the, that that surgeon said, "I can see my name on signs all over the English Mid Midlands." M. Keynes, as in Milton Keynes. Milton, we say that we tend to pronounce the town Keynes rather than Keynes. But that man said he, he's Milo Keynes, who was who was um, uh, John Maynard Keynes as a great nephew, actually. Sorry, not nephew. And he was there to talk about his great uncle as an individual, not as an economist, because Milo Keynes said, I don't know the first thing about economics because I'm a surgeon. But anyway, he's, he subsequently died, unfortunately, Milo Keynes, but he lived to a, a grand old age. So more about um, John Maynard Keynes. Then he went up to um, King's College, uh, Cambridge, um, which was one of the most celebrated colleges in Cambridge University, um, because Cambridge University then had around 20 um, colleges, um, it was almost all male, the university. You know, it would have been over 90% over male, uh, Cambridge University back then. Um, but what else about um, uh, Cambridge in his day? So um, economics was, was, was hardly studied, really. Um, uh, re read, reading more maths, but obviously there's quite a lot of mathematics in, uh, in that. And um, King's College, Cambridge, had been founded just after Eton by um, Henry VI. And the idea was the, the, the scholars of Eton would go on, would go to Eton about the age of 10 to the age of about 14, go on to King's uh, College, Cambridge, to continue their education. And indeed the coat of arms was almost identical. Only in about the 1860s was it opened up to other applicants. Until the 1860s, only um, uh, King's Scholars of Eton could go there. Um, but that's, that's not the case nowadays at all. It has almost no connection. In fact, they're quite reluctant to accept Etonians lest they be accused of um, favoritism. Uh, so what else about his time at Cambridge? He took a double start first, of course, because part of the Cambridge Tripos, you know, how did he do in his um, first year exams? How did he do his finals? That was that. He had an absolutely stellar mind. And um, he, was, he was offered a fellowship. Um, so he went into higher learning. He never pursued a master's degree as such. Obviously having come up, matriculated, having passed his finals, um, within seven years of matriculation, he could upgrade his bachelor's degree into a master's degree um, without any further study, just pay a nominal fee, and that's still the way. Um, it's not sitting any further exams, so that's an MA Cantab. They put Cantab as in Canterbre Canterbregensis, as in of Cambridge, um, to show that it's an MA which is not attained in the normal way through postgraduate study, like where M MA Oxen, as in Oxenensis, as in of Oxford or from Oxford to uh, show you're not trying to suggest to people you did a postgraduate degree. But actually, as Oxford is the oldest university in the Anglosphere, 
Oxford got it right, everyone else will get it wrong, they set the precedent, but there we are. So uh, he came down to London, he did various jobs besides being an academic, and he worked for a bank as well. Um, he speculated on the stock market, he obviously knew what he was doing, and became a very wealthy man. Um, so he was a liberal by politics. And remember, um, uh, in his youth, the Liberal Party was a major force. Um, 1905, the Liberals came back into office. 1906, uh, they, they won the election handily. Well, they won a huge number of seats. Conservatives were reduced to 130 seats. Although actually in share of the vote, the Conservatives didn't do too badly. Only six percentage points fewer than the Liberals. But uh, the scale of the Liberal victory was greatly exaggerated by the first past the post system. Or well, this was to come back and bite them on the arse some years later, when actually it really redounded to the Liberal disadvantage. But anyway, Liberals were on the up and up, and the government was more interventionist, had cast off Gladstonian liberalism, classical liberalism, retrenchment, um, was much more into intervention, new liberalism, plus the Liberals were spooked by the growing strength of the Labour Party, which was tempting away many proletarian voters from, from uh, the Liberals and the Liberals thought, well, we don't want to be socialists, we're going to have to meet them halfway and offer them semi-socialist policies, do something about penury uh, in this country, unnecessary suffering, and they don't want to spend too much on defence. David Lloyd George, Chancellor of the Exchequer, said we want to spend more on the reduction of suffering and not the production of suffering. But then the Anglo-German naval race slightly messed that up, building more warships, dreadnoughts, we want eight and we can't wait said said Tories demanding more warships but um so the first world war came along and he wasn't a pacifist but he was rather skeptical about the cause didn't think it was so clear cut the moral case for it and saw that the allies had to be less than honest and less than ethical sometimes to have much of a hope of winning and uh, obviously by 1918 there was an awful lot of anti-german bile and he was a cosmopolitan sort he had German friends, um, uh, he was fluent in, in French and German, and he went to the Paris Peace Conferences, Versailles and all the others. But um, he uh, was furious about um, the Treaty of Versailles and scathing about it, thinking it was moronic, utterly short-sighted, that Britain really was cutting its own throat. Because by, by wrecking the German economy, the UK was going to wreck its own economy, because the United Kingdom needed to trade with Germany, had to have Germany reasonably prosperous, and, and also sometimes, you know, selling them, your goods and market for your exports, but also sometimes German um, products are cheaper and better quality than anything the United Kingdom could produce. Um, so he was rather into free trade, which was sort of a, an article of faith for liberals at the time. Um, so he wrote the economic consequences of the peace straight away, saying um, we've actually wrecked our economy for years, and so it proved. But so there was, there was um, obstinately high unemployment in the 1920s, the slump. We can conquer unemployment, as the Liberal Party pam pamphlet say, and it said, and he came up with all ideas of how to do it, and really it was just being, being a big spender. Okay, as he walked into the joint, you could tell he was a man of distinction. Not quite like that. That governments should simply create jobs and that would generate wealth, it would get around the economy and the economy would pick up. It's a nice idea, it's just too simple. But isn't that just irresponsible? Is that really going to work? I don't know much about it. And that um, really austerity was not the way to do it. But anyway, the, the, the government was, was cutting back and just cutting lots of budgets to the bone. Um, and unemployment never fell below 10%. Then the Wall Street crash came along with the Great Depression. So he, he said that this is completely wrong-headed. The Liberal Party um, offered him to be, to be, to be uh, a candidate. Many constituencies gave him pressing invitations to be their candidate, but he had no wish to stand for Parliament. Um, so he's not that closely associated with the party, even though, yes, he was a member of it. Uh, he wasn't a party man, it wasn't partisan, it was much more broad-minded. But he was um, here, he lived, he married a Russian ballet dancer, a uh, refugee from Russia after the Civil War. Um, and uh, he uh, was part of the Bloomsbury set, this informal social group of um, people of liberal and left-wing opinions, men and women who believed in equality between men and women, who, who um, had a sort of heterosocial attitude, men and women mingling on an equal footing and not meeting just with, with a view to a romantic relationship, not just a dinner party with only married couples are, are, are around, sometimes having a drinks party, and um, they might be looking to find a romantic partner or not. And they were completely accepting of, of homosexuality. He was bisexual and his wife knew about that. And they had really every kind of reformist view you can imagine. They believed in gender equality, racial equality. They often believed in eugenics. Now that isn't accepted these days. 
but many of their views were highly contentious at the time, but are completely uncontroversial these days. Decolonization, some of them were pacifists, if you know, vegetarians, um, and uh, just doing more to, to alleviate uh, poverty. Um, so um, he was crucial to the government in the, in the Second World War, and um, a lot of his, his, his policies were, were adopted by the Labour Party, uh, become a bit more moderate, I suppose, not wanting to abolish capitalism per se. The Liberal Party, by 1945, was an electoral irrelevance, reduced to only 12 seats out of 650 in Parliament, and he died in 1946. There's only one recording of his voice, and you can see a brief video of him speaking um, uh, shortly before his death, and he spoke in that, um, what's the word, uh, advanced RP accent, so um, uh, very pucker. So that is John Maynard Keynes, regarded as a as an economic whiz kid by many people. And uh, as I say, his ideas have come back into fashions, uh, fashion a little bit. His Margaret Thatcher threw it out, felt that it was all bunkum, and uh, said, well, we've got to embrace the ideas of other economists, Friedrich Hayek, and so forth. That's enough about John Maynard Keynes.